there is a lot going on in the gut. I don't think we can just test the blood or the urine and say, oh, this is what it is. Let's supplement and add more or less. I just don't think we're there yet. I think we may get there to a point, but again, even looking at the hormones, we're testing the hormones, we're telling what's in the bloodstream. It's not telling what's going on with the receptors. Stress is the inflammation that robs us of life, energy, and happiness. Our typical solutions for gut health and hormone balance have let a lot of us down. We're over-medicated and underserved. At The Less Stressed Life, we're a community of health-savvy women exploring solutions outside of our traditional Western medicine toolbox and training to raise the bar and change our stories. Each week, our hope is that you leave our sessions inspired to learn, grow, and share these stories to raise the bar in your life and home. Okay, if you have food sensitivities, then this message is for you. I actually polled people on Instagram last month, and almost 80% of the people that saw my story said that they felt like they had food sensitivities. So that's a problem because once you dive into the intricacies of that, there is a lot of nuance. So to help with this and answer the question I get in many varieties each week, I am hosting a live training. That means we can get together in real time and talk. And I would love that a live training and a Q and a session called what should I eat? Answering your questions about food reactions and inflammation. You can register for that at kristabigler.com forward slash food reactions. That link will be in the show notes and I'm covering how you know if you're sensitive to food and what else is happening that has to be resolved to overcome food sensitivities. You don't just need to bounce from diet to diet to diet at all whatsoever and where you should start for different inflammatory symptoms like skin issues and autoimmunity and histamine issues and hormone issues and gut issues and fatigue and pain and how to tell what you're sensitive to. Also, very importantly, I'm covering common mistakes that happen when you Google this topic or just in general, things that happen to even providers in their recommendations around food sensitivities that are honestly making things worse. So, and of course, your questions answered by me. I love to talk to you guys. I love talking to people. It's my favorite thing ever. So register for that webinar, kristabigler.com forward slash food reactions. It is live on January 25th, and there'll be a replay available for about a week after that. All right. See you there. Access to functional or specialized medicine testing and standard blood work is a big piece of personalizing care plans to help our clients succeed. But getting accounts with multiple labs and ordering and tracking results from many different web portals slows efficiency by bogging us down in admin work. This is why I'm completely obsessed with our podcast sponsor, Rupa Health. It's a single portal that allows you to order from over 20 specialty labs in one incredibly simple dashboard. I'm talking less than 30 seconds to set up your free account and about 30 seconds to order the labs you need. All the results are in one place and I can securely send clients their results with a click of a button. A big advantage for our clients is that standard blood work can be ordered for almost two thirds less than other direct to consumer lab sites. Rupa is a lab concierge, so they send the lab invoices on your behalf if a client pays for their own labs. They help them get set up with a lab draw, navigate testing questions, and they provide the requisition forms. It's literally a dream. Go sign up for free to help streamline your practice and simplify ordering labs for your clients at rupahealth.com. That's R-U-P-A health.com and let them know I sent you when you sign up. You can also check out the show notes for this episode for a short video walkthrough of how I use Rupa Health in my own practice. All right, today on The Lester's Life, we have Dr. Tim Hyatt, who is my favorite Dutch test consultant. Dutch is a dried urine test for comprehensive hormone status. So I get to talk to Dr. Hyatt every once in a while. And I was finally able to talk him into coming on and talking all about anxiety. I love the way his brain works. So this is a little bit about Dr. Hyatt. As an innovator who enjoys discovery, research, and science, he loves to create and improve products that help people. It was his frustration with conventional medicine's treatment of his mother when she came down with a life-threatening, life-ending chronic illness that turned his thoughts to alternative and integrative medicine. Dr. Hyatt earned his doctorate in naturopathic medicine at the National College of Natural Medicine in Portland, Oregon in 2006. And from there, he began to work in the biotech industry where he was directly involved in product development research, sales, and marketing. His first product was an amino acid formula that improves symptoms of brain-based disorders. And in late 2011, after moving his practice to Oregon, he founded Biogenic Nutrition with other partners, currently serves as the company's president. So my point is, is that he knows a lot about hormones and he knows a lot about 
brain-based stuff, depression, anxiety, et cetera. And migraines. He actually, if you heard the episode on migraines with, I think it was Dr. Adam Harcourt, who was amazing. People loved him. That was a referral from Dr. Hyatt. So thank you, Dr. Hyatt. Welcome. Thank you, Krista. Nice to be with you today. Yeah. So we're going to chat a little bit about anxiety. You and I've been chatting about that a little bit on the phone and you've said a lot of things. You're like, Hey, when someone comes in and presents with anxiety, I have a mental checklist for those things. That's like such a practitioner things to say in general, backing up. I will mention when I got into working in gut health, I was very unprepared for the amount of anxiety that I encountered working in practice. So I'm wondering how you kind of, and maybe like this ties in with your mom's story. I think I included that part in your bio about your mom's story, just because I think that's really how a lot of people get to integrative and natural, like holistic medicine is we kind of hit too many roadblocks with the other options. And we know that there's got to be more options. So if you want to take it from there a little bit, if you have any comments about that, and then just sort of like, why is this topic of interest to you? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it started with my mother's health condition. She had a condition called Scheidrager syndrome. The name has since been changed to multiple system atrophy, which is kind of a Parkinson plus syndrome. And my mom and I are very close. She's a very smart lady, very deeply spiritual, very intuitive person, very, very bright. And, you know, she was very frustrated with conventional medicine. So I just decided to start looking into what were the options out there. I had no idea what naturopathic medicine was at all. And so as I was doing research, I found out that there was this alternative medicine. I grew up in, you know, the conventional medicine world. There was no consideration for anything else. And once I found this, I decided, gosh, I mean, I was a little bit frustrated with my situation working in the lab. And in the Portland area, there's not a lot of biotech companies. And I felt that I would have to move if if I was to stay in the industry. So I, I decided to kind of branch out and, and do start looking into this. And as her condition progressed, I, I ended up you know, going to school, focusing on natural medicine, trying to figure out, you know, for her what was going on. But I I also thought for me, it was just like, you know, my brain works that way. I like to look at deeper issues. I tend to be very open-minded when it comes to lots of different situations and medicine was one of them. So I ended up going into this initially because of that, but it really, it piqued my interest and I wanted to know more about it. So that's how I ended up doing what I'm doing. Cool. About how did anxiety start to creep into your practice? How did you start seeing it? And then there's this whole hormone piece. So anything you want to say about anxiety stuff, yeah. and then we can go into that. Like when someone comes in and presents with anxiety as their primary, and I feel like, I mean, people don't come to me with that as the primary, but it's mm-hmm. such a huge, like second, third or fourth thing for a lot of people sometimes. It really is. I think if you're looking at patient intake forms, I mean, the box is checked for a lot of people. And I think, you know, for anybody who's asking the right questions will come up with, you're going to see that sometime in the practice. And I think sometimes, especially with males, it's not verbalized, but we see that a lot in male patients. And so those who are more open-minded about it will mention it in a form or in conversation after a period of time. You know, my practice basically started out with whoever comes in the door, I'm going to see. And back when I was doing this, when I started back in 2000. Six, two 2007, anybody that came in the door, you would treat. I mean, I practiced in my town that I lived in, southwest of Portland, and the town was not very exposed to alternative medicine. Portland certainly is, of course, if anybody knows anything about mm-hmm. Portland. But anything that came in the door, I would tackle and, and try to take on. And so people wanted to see alternative medicine practitioner. And so I was one of the guys in town. So it started out with incidental findings, patients come in and they start mentioning cases. I I had several cases the first year that I could think of and did quite a bit of work on that. But I was looking for solutions that were brain-based. I didn't do a lot of hormone testing early on. I did a little bit, but really dove into this years later when I was exposed to the Dutch test. And, And we can talk about that in a minute. But my practice, I started treating people using amino acids. And I worked in an office where there was uh, worked with an addiction counselor. And we teamed up on quite a few cases and started seeing really great results with amino acid therapy and a lot of talk and feedback from each other on cases and figured out that people did better when they were supplementing amino acids to help calm the brain down, whether it be just to hit those dopamine receptors or the serotonin receptors with amino acids or you know, the combination of that and the therapy, what happened was he was seeing results with his patients that were 90 day sobriety programs for sex addiction. The results were much better with amino acids than they were without. And so we kind of started that way. 
as practice went along, I started getting more into physical medicine. I was very interested in my experience as a when I was younger with chiropractic and with spinal manipulation, but then getting into body work and, and deep tissue work. And I did some training in, in school for that and developed a practice around treating people with some modalities of manual therapies and manipulation a, a little bit. As a naturopath in Oregon, we can do a lot. And I saw so many people that were musculoskeletal patients that had pain that were affected and they had lots of anxiety. Not that they were diagnosed per se with anxiety disorder, but some of them were. But a lot of them, they just were tense and in pain and anxious. And so we did a lot of work with those types of patients and saw great results. I mean, what I've pretty much figured out was if you get your hands on patients, they do better. So we go through all of the testing that you would need to do. Back then, there was no functional medicine. There were, the term didn't exist. And so it was just alternative medicine. But we ended up treating a lot of people in a functional way because we would run labs. We would try to open up the case and figure out what was going on with them. So for me, it was sort of a covering a lot of bases from brain chemistry to physical medicine and then watching how that anxiety piece played a role and, and interacted with those modalities and, and how we could help people improve over time by some of the things that we were doing. Okay. This brought up a few questions for me. Okay. Yeah. First of all, when you're talking about amino acid therapy, mm -hmm. I'm literally mm -hmm. drinking electrolytes of amino acids. I'm liking <laughs> them better. I feel like it's like more alert than just regular yeah. electrolytes. Yeah. When you started doing amino acid therapy, were you doing kind of just broad spectrum? Let me just do amino acids in general, or are you kind of trying to like target specific ones for any reason? Or are you just being kind of synergistic? Let's support all of them. Yeah, no, initially I went to a seminar that Marty Hins. H-I-N-Z put out, he basically had a company called CHK Nutrition, and they were doing amino acid therapy with patients. And it's based on this idea that serotonin and dopamine share transporters. And if you supplement serotonin, the serotonin system with 5-HTP excessively, you can actually deplete dopamine's effect in the body and vice versa. So he figured out that 5-HTP in, in uh, tyrosine need to be supplemented in a one to 10 ratio. And so going down that path, we used these products and there is there was also testing with these to figure out what the patient is. Now, I want to take a step back and say that neurotransmitter testing outside of supplementation, I've got some issues with, and, and maybe we could talk about that now or in another date, but the testing was only to figure out if you were supplementing the adequate amount of hormone or the adequate amount of amino acids. And so the whole protocol is built around 5-HTP and tyrosine, supplementing the dopamine, norepinephrine, and, and serotonin system simultaneously. And what ends up happening is you get a balancing effect, if you will, by adding the right amounts of these neuro uh, amino acids. And over time, over a short period of time, you can get really great results. So we use CHK products for quite some time. Eventually, in practice, I found you know, kind of figured out some things that I wanted to do a little bit differently. And so we started looking at coming up with a product that was, had some different components in it and supplemented differently and in our patient practice. And so we did that and we started getting great results. And so I, I mentioned before that I was working with that psychologist and we saw fantastic results. And so we just started, we kept making that product for our patients and eventually just put it online so that you know, other people could buy it online and it was quite successful and we've gotten really good results from it. So it's another modality that I can use outside of looking at the hormones. It's really, really helpful for a lot of people. Okay. So to clarify, you said, and I don't know if this is a product that still exists that you guys have come up with. So two mm -hmm. comments, you yeah. said 5-HTP to tyrosine one to 10. So you're saying like, for example, 100 milligrams of 5-HTP to 1,000 milligrams of tyrosine. I just don't want us to accidentally misunderstand that. Not saying yeah. someone should necessarily experiment with it. Just saying, right. let's not get that backwards, right? right. So just right. making sure that's correct. And then I do want to talk about neurotransmitter testing for anxiety because sometimes people come to mm -hmm. you and they're like, oh, can you do neurotransmitter testing? Because my doctor yeah. thinks that maybe I should do that. And I'm like, yeah, but what's that going to tell you? Like, right. Right. Because neurotransmitters are made with things and the gut is very involved and all those things. So that's like my feels about that. So I want to talk about neurotransmitter testing for anxiety, how you feel about that. And then also, you know, a lot of times we back up and we're like, you can't out supplement 
life, you know, a little bit. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I just do want to acknowledge, do you feel like you see had great success as a supplement, which I think is incredible and awesome and wonderful. And everyone's looking for Mm -hmm. tools for anxiety because it's like the most incapacitating thing ever Mm -hmm. for success, for results, et cetera. So you feel like the results you saw specifically were that you could really use that. And were you also trying to get them to do lifestyle changes? Also, I think that's my question. Were you out supplementing lifestyle or did you feel like you had to do both in tandem there? I know as both clinicians, in, we're yeah, like- yeah, yeah, definitely both in tandem. I think, you know, as a naturopath, the whole point is that you're treating the person holistically and you're really looking at all factors. And I think the problem with the training that I received is it, anything goes in, in terms of which direction you want to go, right? Or the, the licensing in, in the state of Oregon for a naturopath is very liberal. You can do just about anything. We can do minor surgery. We can do prescriptions. We can do everything. So no, for me, it was more a combination of does the patient need to be on an antidepressant? Yes, no. You know, going down the checklist of things that I would need to do now, moving over to neurotransmitter testing, Yeah, my feeling is the same as yours. We have not done the studies in CNS fluid to correlate CNS levels with blood levels with urine levels. Nobody's done those studies. So I don't think that we can accurately determine what's going on in the brain by testing the urine. The serotonin and dopamine are controlled, levels are controlled in the kidney. So how much you have in the bloodstream and in the urine ends up being controlled by the kidney. And and if you take in compounds that increase, serotonin, your body's going to eliminate more serotonin. So there isn't an imbalance created Mm -hmm. and there is a lot going on in the gut. I don't think we can just test the blood or the urine and say, oh, this is what it is. Let's supplement and add more or less. I just don't think we're there yet. I think we may get there to a point, but again, even looking at the hormones, we're testing the hormones where they're telling what's in the bloodstream. It's not telling what's going on with the receptors. So there is going to be, even if we have adequate hormone tests or a blood testing for neurotransmitters, there's going to be a limit to that technology. It's, I think it would be great. I think it would be really useful, but I think at the end of the day, we can't see what's going on in the brain with regard to receptor function and hits on the brain, unless we're doing very well controlled radio labeled studies. And, you know, that's just not going to be feasible in a a bigger scale for, I don't know, who knows, Mm -hmm. maybe forever. Anxiety is a tough topic because it affects, we were talking offline about how many people are affected by it. So when you kind of do mm-hmm. a quick search, then NIH years ago said maybe 30% and you're like, that's those that acknowledge it. And maybe mm-hmm. we should give service really quickly to, you said such a very powerful thing, which is kind of why I try, I somewhat avoid men in practice because mm-hmm you can't like help someone who doesn't really think they have a problem. So like you said, males say they don't have anxiety. What does that sometimes look like a little bit on the inside or outside? Like, how does it feel to have anxiety? Maybe we should actually acknowledge that. Sure. And I mean, I could speak by experience because I mean, I I think every one of us could, if we actually thought about it and I thought about it because I'm the position I'm in and I'm trying to sort through what that means for me and, and how that's relating to all of these things going on. I think anxiety presents in so many different ways that being able to verbalize that maybe requires somebody to know what what the definition of anxiety is. So let me just take you to, you know, the very, very simple definition of anxiety, which is it's our reaction or response to the emotion of fear. So anxiety is something, it's a response to fear. Fear is primal, right? Fear is programmed into our brainstem. We experience that because of some perceived danger. And so if you come down to it, people have to be able to verbalize what anxiety is. Well, they don't really know. They hear anxiety. First thing men do is they say, nah, that's not me, right? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not anxious. Because they picture somebody who's anxious, who's biting their nails or shivering in the corner or whatever. And that, that doesn't fit with a lot of people's image. That's not how they want to be perceived. Mm-hmm. But it's really so exactly. much more than that. And I, I think for men, it's figuring out, okay, do I, am I, is what I'm feeling? And then you start looking into what you're feeling. You think nervousness, tension, heartbeat increasing or palpitations, shortness of breath, sweating, dizziness, ear ringing, trouble concentrating, sleeping, GI distress. So there's a whole list of things out there. That Ruminating, that overanalyzing, oh, maybe. Over-analyzing, right? I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about men that I know that have anxiety that presents in these Mm -hmm. ways that they may not say some of those symptoms, but ruminating, overanalyzing, stressing out about that, right? 
Mm -hmm. You said something really important. You said, you know, it's how you want to be perceived and anxiety is a weakness thing. We've been really thinking about this so much because from a marketing standpoint, in a really like honest, transparent way, people don't resonate necessarily with the word stress. They're just like, Mm, yeah, I know I have it. So like, whatever, right? I can't well, do anything it, It's it. dismissed. Yes, it's People dismissed. dismiss the word of stress and they just say, no. I mean, I talked to probably 20 providers today and I get a great perspective. And I'm so thankful to be able to talk with people and just brilliant people like yourself and, and, and others who are just, everybody has a different way of thinking. And it is so nice to be able to bounce ideas off of people and listen to their stories and, you know, how they perceive things, but we have gotten anxiety and stress wrong. I'm constantly reminded to be able to emphasize the stress piece when I'm talking about a Dutch test. And so if I see results like elevated cortisol levels or low cortisol levels, I have to remind myself and the people that we're talking with, we have these conversations around what does, does a level correlate to stress or is it just the best effort the body can do given the amount of stress they're under. We can't really quantify stress very well, Krista. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're very at such a early stage of being able to understand what this actually means. And it comes back to, and I'll throw these words out more than once, but it's perception and perspective. So basically perception essentially involves the senses, right? The physical senses, Mm -hmm. but it also involves this we get into these realms of some, this interpretation of what's going on in the world around us. And that you can get in the weeds in about two seconds here. So I'm, I'm not even going to go there because it's one, it's way over my head and it's philosophy. And if you start talking about this, you start talking about consciousness, then it just gets crazy. But I'm interested in that because mm-hmm. <laughs> I think that's where we need to go when it comes to this conversation. I love the nuts and bolts and the neurotransmitters and the hormones and all of this, but we have to have a bigger conversation hmm. because this last year with all of the stuff that's gone on with COVID and with the economy and the threat with the monetary system and all the things that are going on now, it can get really scary really quick. And I think we have to be on guard and know that you can't just change a lab level and change your feelings about what's going on in the world around you. And I think, you know, right now, that's what I'm really interested in. We had talked earlier about what has changed for me. What's changed for me is that I'm really thinking in a much bigger picture now and looking at some of these things rather than just going, okay, let's poke around at these, the biochemistry a little bit and see if we can shift it. I think it's really important. And I think it's a great tool to be able to calm, get people in a calmer state. But I am of the opinion that we really need to be having these bigger conversations. And when we talk about stress and your podcast is great because you're dealing with all of these aspects, I think we really have to take stress seriously. Because we know that cortisol plays such a huge role and it can really damage the body and the tissues. Oh, totally. And we should talk about that. I'm making a quick note, Mm -hmm. but I'm going to share with you how this has been affecting us in Mm -hmm. business as well, because I think you will appreciate it. And it's part of this bigger picture. So for us, the biggest thing as an Enneagram three who loves results, the biggest heartbreak for me was seeing how much cortisol Mm -hmm. and you said, Anxiety definition is our reaction or response to the emotion of fear. Well, I talk about this a lot because I heard it once and I'm like, this totally makes sense. And I like to oversimplify things. We only have two emotions, fear and happiness. And so of course, everyone's got some has had fear, right? And it's very primal. It's our monkey mind. It's like our body is made to defend us. And you don't even realize like until I really lived away from my parents for, you know, over a decade, I didn't realize until I went home how fear mongering they could really be. You don't even know what you're living in when you're growing up in that bottle. If you don't get outside the bottle, right? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. for us, then moving forward, I was fascinated with inflammation when I was starting to do private practice stuff in 2015. Before that, I've been working in clinical for several years. So it's really interested in inflammation. And I was looking for a synonym for inflammation. That's really the name of the podcast, Less Stress Life. Hmm. Well, recently we've been evaluating, you know, we want to touch people because we think this is like the thing. But like you said, the word doesn't really resonate. Like people don't respond to it because they're like, Ugh, right. whatever, it's kind of a weakness term. And I would mm-hmm. think that like everyone who's here is like actually quite powerful and awesome and wonderful. So we have really sexed up our terms back here in the back end. And we're like literally just last week because in practice, when people glaze over it, or you said it in a different way, like we discount it, I think, or dismiss it. We were, we dismissed that word. That was exactly my feeling is we dismiss it. I wasn't using that word, but that's a perfect word. So now we're like, okay, we've got nervous system imbalances. 
we've got to work on neuroplasticity work because if we're constantly paving neural pathways that are fight or flight or under fear or under anxiety, no wonder you're not flexible to go down a different path when the road Mm -hmm. to work is blocked, you know? So, um, so I've actually like removed, I was addressing everything so clinically like you would, right? Like that's what we think mm-hmm. our role is. And it's technically how we're trained or that we've learned. And so you're doing everything so clinically. And I was like, dang it. I can't nourish these cells back together. If you can't quit killing the cells, man. Right, right. Like I, I was like, I got to back up and put this other stuff at the beginning that sometimes mm-hmm. isn't that sexy. So how do we make it more interesting? So people don't dismiss it. So I'm with you on this. I I love that right in the middle of it with you. (laughs) Good. Yeah. I think, you know, there's this idea that with consciousness and again, this can get weird for people real quick, but this idea that a lot of these ideas come in waves and they come to a lot of people at the same time. And I think we're going that direction where we're really starting to step back and take a bigger, bigger look because what we've been doing has worked to a point it can't get us a whole lot further. Mm -hmm. We have to do something different. So I I really like the fact that you're doing that. I think it's it's needed. And when I talk to practitioners, that's the one message I'm getting across to them is, look, we got to stop just looking at the lab. The lab is really important, but it's one piece. So let's check that box off and then then move into some of these other things. Mm -hmm. It's the self-limiting piece, you know, because we can do, I can do everything. And if you're going to keep dumping nutrients based Mm -hmm. on the nervous system response, then Mm -hmm. you're going to end up back where you started. And I don't want that. Like that's my least favorite thing in the world. I I want you to succeed and be awesome forever. So I want to talk about cortisol and get into hormone stuff a little bit and talk about what Mm -hmm. does happen in the body. But let me back up before we get there, because you mentioned something, you were seeing people that had pain issues And there was a lot of anxiety related to it. It brought me to a case where I was thinking about a woman who long story short was diagnosed by her rheumatoid, like just kind of felt like I have overall inflammation. I've got all this stuff and nothing is really working. And people say that all the time, if I had a quarter Mm -hmm. for every time, but really had actually seen a lot of integrative practitioners, et cetera. I was kind of running into a wall and I could see there was an emotional piece here, but the rheumatologist actually diagnosed her with fibromyalgia and depression Mm. at the end of the day. Sure. So, and what you said, I have the notes here. So, so many people in musculoskeletal pain that also had anxiety. My question is, we've talked about this a little bit, but what's going on in the brain a little bit more in anxiety and some of this, like if you're seeing musculoskeletal pain, you're also seeing anxiety, what's happening in the brain? Well, I, I mean, I think this gets to looking at the whole individual. I mean, you got the GI piece, which you're very aware of and paying attention to, and, and the fact that the inflammatory cascade that results from leaky gut and the damage that can happen to the hypothalamus. Well, well those inflammatory compounds like TNF and IL-6 can stimulate cortisol release. So we have that aspect, we have the inflammatory aspect, and we go to some of the things that are going on. So let's let's just do a quick tour around the body and mention, okay, we've got the hormones and we're going to talk about that in a minute. And then we have, you know, what's going on in the brain, how we perceive when I just go back to that word over and over again, I just, I'm, I'm reading a book on perception and, mm-hmm. and it's a tough read, but I'm determined to get through it because I feel like it's important to sort of have some context for somebody else who's thinking about this in a philosophical way, but looking at how the signal gets in, you know, whether it's, this is strictly like brainstem fear response, and then we go with anxiety, we take that fear and we run with it, and then we recreate and change neural pathways. We got the limbic system just in front of and above and adjacent to the brainstem, and it communicates in, in part with the frontal lobe, but very little. That executive function happens in the frontal lobe. The limbic system with all of these organs like the hippocampus and the amygdala and the nucleus accumbens and these organs or these parts of the brain deal with fear and they deal with anxiety and they deal with learning and there's all of this stuff that goes on in this, this crosstalk between different parts of the brain. Well, in these organs or in these parts of the brain, you've got the compounds, the, the neurotransmitters that act in the synapse to create um, an excitatory or inhibitory response. The, the old language was, you know, sympathetic, parasympathetic. We're still using it, but in excitatory, inhibitory, what we're finding out now is that we wanted to categorize those into very, these neurotransmitters are excitatory and these are inhibitory. We're finding out in general, that's true, but these different neurotransmitters play a huge role in both excitatory and inhibitory processes because of receptors. We always talk about the neurotransmitter, but we have to remember the receptors 
on that postsynaptic neuron. And then post would be the, the neuron that the hormone or the uh, neurotransmitter is going to. Presynaptic would be the one it's coming from. All of these receptors on these postsynaptic parts of the neuron, on the neuron and the dendrites. And what will happen is you'll get this transmission and it hits these certain receptors. And depending on the number of receptors and, and the subtypes, you can excite or you can inhibit. So with serotonin, there's a whole bunch of subreceptors. You can get excitation and you can get inhibition depending on where it is in the brain. So, and I'm going somewhere with this. I don't want to get too far into the weeds here too, but this is a, for instance, we used to think serotonin, well, it's inhibitory, but we used to think that serotonin, low serotonin led to anxiety, right? Because mm-hmm. serotonin is about a, a sense of well-being. Turns well, out- We certainly still treat it that way conventionally. No, we do. But it's funny <laughs> because I read a study in 2000. 15. And it turns out that they did this radio labeled tracer with serotonin and found out that, and then they used, I believe it was a PET scan. They ran this data on lots of of people and they found out the people with social anxiety or social phobia, their brain lit up with serotonin in the limbic system, which is totally counter to what we've believed in the past, which was, we thought it was low serotonin. Mm. It's just not that simple. But I think the idea that, that serotonin is more plentiful in these areas of the brain that are lighting up, that are creating a fear response or an anxiety response, ultimately, is fascinating. So you have serotonin, you have norepinephrine, you have GABA, you have glutamate. GABA and glutamate sort of oppose each other. GABA is more inhibitory, glutamate's more excitatory. And glutamate's really the one that doesn't get as, as much credit as it should, but it does play a huge role. Norepinephrine, noradrenaline in the brain is very different in the way that it signals in the brain than it does in the peripheral system, but it actually stimulates the release of corticotropin releasing hormone, which stimulates the cortisol response. And then, then we're into you know fight, flight, or, or freeze responses along with increases in those neurotransmitter or the cortisol, we get neuro increase in neurotransmitters as well. So glutamate's upregulated. So it's as if once you get into a chronic pattern, you get the fear response, those things calm down. But if you get continued fear or change in perception, then you start running with that fear. Then what happens is the brain, there is some neuroplasticity. We do get changes in the tissue locally. And some of those parts of the brain that like the, in the limbic system, they will actually change and get bigger or smaller depending on how much input there is into the system. So once you activate fight, flight, or freeze, and then you've got this perpetuation of all of these excitatory neurotransmitters along with cortisol. And we can talk about what cortisol does too, but. Okay. So I'm going to do a quick overview. One of the things that stood out to us, to me is that Well, and this is how we treat with SSRIs or basically things that slow down the release of serotonin. So you said we used to think low serotonin led to anxiety, but, and we find this in medicine a lot. And I say, you know, it's, it sounds contradictory because I'm like, let's oversimplify everything, but sometimes we oversimplify and it's like, it wasn't that simple. There was a lot more to it. Exactly. And so I get always a little bit challenged. It's like, I want people to have support, especially when anxiety is wildly unchecked. I want people to have support because that could be better than continuing to let it run rampant because we continue to go down this pathway. We actually have tissue change. And so that's where we start to see excessive food sensitivities, ulcers. I mean, basically if you had a condition chronically, like this is something everyone should care about. Because mm-hmm. if we have like with pain, we were talking, that's kind of where I think this conversation started. If you have continuous pain, there's a bit of a communication and it's like, you start to lose track of which side the communication is coming from after a while. Is the pain driving the brain or is the brain starting to drive the pain after a while? Because it's been so repetitious. Yeah. And I think, I think the, you know, pain again is something that's perceived. Obviously there's a biochemical component to it, but a lot of times the people that have the most emotional pain and trauma are chronic pain patients. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole lot of overlap there and getting into those mechanisms. And I think part of the problem is when people have pain, they're anxious. Mm -hmm. So I found that when you get your hands on them, they actually, the pain reduces dramatically. And then you're getting into things like, you know, oxytocin, right? Basically the neuropeptide that is released when we are exposed to physical touch. We often think about that in a more of a a sexual perspective, but really any physical touch creates a release of oxytocin, which actually calms the nervous system down. Mm -hmm. So 
I think we have to think even deeper. We get in all these neuropeptides that are released, co-released with neurotransmitters that are signaling and doing different things. We don't understand the depth of that yet. Well, we do. And it's like to talk about dismissing things. I mean, what you just said, if we can calm the nervous system down when exposed to physical touch, what is your natural response to touch? Or do you have love or touch in your life? You know, I mean, those are like reasonable questions, but we can dismiss those. And the really cool thing is this sounds, I mean, hopefully this doesn't sound doomsday. I want to like turn this around a little bit. So if you have constant stuff going down these wrong pathways, we're losing neuroplasticity, we're changing tissues, we're starting to like create more pain, disease Mm -hmm. symptoms. Mm -hmm. But the cool thing is we've got a boatload of modalities that are completely drug-free that can help recreate this situation. And what I learned from a recent episode was like, you can be as old as possible and still regain neuroplasticity when using the right modalities. I mean, when I was interviewing this guy around his system that uses binaural beats, and I'm just real obsessed with this the last couple of weeks, Mm. they use this for weeks with like 90 something year old people and saw a 40% increase in neuroplasticity. And I don't know how I measured that. Right. But it's like, Mm super freaking cool. It's like, and I think I want to make sure the message is super clear here. The whole purpose mm-hmm. of this podcast is that there's always another way. Yep. Yep. <laughs> there's always more options than, than yep. what you've been given so far. Like anytime someone says I've tried everything, I'm like, no, you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> no, you haven't. I know you haven't. So yeah. I have a clinical question and then mm-hmm. we can go over some other hormone stuff. Anything you want yeah. to add to that is cool too. Sure. But my clinical question that may not be a fit for you or us, but I feel like when we go on depression meds or anti-anxiety meds, they seem to take a while to work. And then we have to titrate off them very slowly. And why is that? Like, why is the response so slow? I always kind of wonder that in general with medication, and I'd like to understand that more. And maybe you know the answer, maybe you don't. I'll give you a very surface answer because when it comes to the particulars of adding medications, I think some of these medications we use, these neuroleptic medications that we use are, they're so complex. They don't really even know how they work. They know that they do. They know that they'll do these studies and and check to see if it hits these receptors and in either mouse models or animal models or with these imaging studies. But just just take SSRIs, for instance, because that's, that's a very popular drug category and used, I think 14% of people in the United States use SSRIs, something like that. It's, I don't it's know. astounding. SSRIs in general, they're still trying to figure out how they work, but when so they give weird. them, they do get, I know, it's just, when they give these drugs as a class in general, and each of them are different and they hit different sub receptors. So I, I don't want to oversimplify this, and but we're leaving, they block the presynaptic neurons so that the serotonin can stay in the synapse longer and have more binding events. Monoamine oxidase degrades serotonin in the synapse when it's in the synapse too long. So what ends up happening is you get degradation of serotonin, for instance, and this happens with norepinephrine too. You get degradation of that neurotransmitter if it's in the synapse too long by MAO. And it really depends on the patient's MAO activity. Well, we all know that MAO is subject to genetic alteration. And there are SNPs for for that. And so we can have different levels. Each person has different levels of MAO activity. So when you give these SSRIs, you don't really know how the patient's going to respond. Of course, we have statistics that say this percent of people respond in this way. This is probably a good medication for them. And it works great for some people. Other people, it doesn't work well for because they've got a different set of neurotransmitters, different abilities for making it, different enzymes, different genetics. So at the end of the day, when a patient goes on these medications, you really don't know how they're going to work until they're on them. And you may have to switch dose or switch medications to make them work. Some people, they work brilliantly and other people, they work, they're horrible. And so speaking of going off of the medications, what ends up happening is you've got all these hits on these receptors and this, this expected level of neurotransmission. Let's just say again, with an SSRI, they try to stop them and they have a terrible response. Well, one of the things we learned was if we supplement um, 5-HTP and and tyrosine in these ratios, like we talked about, there are other compounds, by the way, that I didn't mention that are really, really important, like sulfur source, like cysteine, methionine. But And there are several products out there on the market that have these ratios. But I would say if you're tapering from the use of SSRIs, you're going to need hits on those receptors, which means you're going to need more, better balance between the dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine system. And what I found is patients feel a whole lot better if they go off these medications, if you actually provide the amino acids to sort of let them down carefully and slowly rather than that, you know, stop and they they really struggle. Mm -hmm. Before we leave this topic, 
You were talking a lot about the importance of receptor function, which we could, that counts for everything, yeah, blood sugar, et cetera. Much. Is there anything else that we should know about like nourishing receptor function at all before we move on? Well, if you're talking about in the brain, I think the important thing is good nutrition mm-hmm. and reduction of inflammation. I think those two things. So it goes back to the gut. Cool. I really think if we have good balance in the gut, we're going to have the best chance because we're eliminating that source of inflammation that's coming into the body, into the tube every time we eat. Mm -hmm. So if we can reduce that and get good nutrition, so balanced diet, healthy protein intake, good absorption of those proteins in the form of amino acids into the bloodstream, I think we have the best chance. You'd mentioned you were taking some amino acids and there's some new products on the market right now that make it very palatable. And I think they're fantastic. I think people can get really, really good results by just doing a good essential amino acid formula. Mm -hmm. And then of course, as practitioners, I just noticed this over the last 10, 12 years is that we go from people taking multivitamins, minerals to, no, we're just going to do these essential things like vitamin D and magnesium that we start piecing it out. We're missing all of these nutrients now. So Mm -hmm. when I talk to providers with Dutch, I'm always bringing up the fact you need to make sure to cover the nutrient basis. The HPA is going to work well, and we can segue into that if you wanted. You have to have those nutrient cofactors that the brain uses to make neurotransmitters and to make hormones or to make those processes work. You have to have those in place if you actually want to heal the adrenals. I love when people underscore the work we do over here, right? Good yeah. nutrition, reduction of inflammation. Yeah. Good abs- and I think the other thing I want to make sure is really clear. People don't digest protein and use amino acids very well because of gut health, because of yeah. stress. It started yeah. with stress and that's really like the result of it long-term. Um, so yeah. people feel like they've kind of got a brick in their gut or whatever, and it mm-hmm. sucks, you know, and it starts yeah. to lead to all this other stuff. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about hormones in general. So like Mm -hmm. going back to the overarching question here, which is when someone presents with anxiety, what are all the things that go through your head that could be drivers? Why don't we spout off that list, including things that are hormone related and then jump into some hormones? Yeah. So again, just from the top down very briefly, it starts with that perceived stress, that fear, the perceived stress, and then it goes into the body. And basically we take that on and we say, okay, there's got to be some response generated here. So when you get that signal into the body, Adrenaline is released, cortisol is released, that comes in from norepinephrine in the brain, but gets into that area of the amygdala called the paraventricular nucleus, and that stimulates the release of corticosteroid CRH. From there, it stimulates ACTH in the pituitary gland, which stimulates the release of cortisol in the adrenal glands. And so what we end up having is this cortisol response that's responding to lots of things, inflammation, Perceived stress is probably the biggest one, but inflammation and then mobilizing blood sugar, for instance. So, you know, I work for Dutch and I talk to people that we look at at cortisol results and we talk about the cortisol response in the context of the patient case and figure out when we're looking at cortisol. So the compounds that we look at with Dutch are going to be free cortisol, free cortisone, and metabolized cortisol. Those are the big markers. Then we look at it, have a total DHEA number, and that gives us an idea of what DHEA is doing. When we're looking at patient cases, we're analyzing, okay, what does the cortisol response look like compared to what we think it should look like? Because we always, we always start there, right? Patient case comes in is like, patient says, my cortisol is off. Or the provider has this understanding that the patient's really stressed. We need to check the cortisol level and see what to do. It's great because cortisol gives us a really good reading of what's going on. So we can look at those numbers and make a determination of how much cortisol the patient is releasing given their situation, is it appropriate, an appropriate amount of cortisol, or is there some pathology in that system? So right out of the gate, we have to kind of take the patient context, look at the cortisol levels, see if they're appropriate, and then figure out which direction to go. And that's kind of how the whole thing starts. But we'll build a whole patient case around, okay, what's going on with the adrenal system? How stressed are they? And then do we need to alter adrenal hormones? Do we need to alter sex hormones? So when it comes down to it, you're looking at sex hormones, you're looking at DHA, of course, I mentioned that. And then we look at at not just testosterone, but the other androgens with testosterone and get an understanding of what those look like. If you have low testosterone, females are more likely to experience anxiety or at least, and I actually am not sure this is true, but statistically, 
there are more females that report anxiety. I think it's there's just as much in males. But ironically, their androgen levels are quite a bit lower overall in females than they are in males. And we have this idea that testosterone can lead to low testosterone can lead to anxiety. Well, we see that in both males and females. When there's a certain threshold, when those levels are low enough, we talk about andropause in males, when those levels kind of really drop, there will be more anxiety. You know, And in females, it's really very much the same. Those levels drop to a point, maybe they don't feel it as much because the levels to start with were lower, but they do pick up on those changes. And we do find that most females, when we write prescriptions for testosterone, they feel better. Mm -hmm. They don't feel as anxious. So we're looking at that. We look at the neurological changes potentially that come from hormone changes. So we will have, you know, rises and fall of estrogen and progesterone, depending on so many factors that we still don't understand at all. Admittedly, patients can experience a fair amount of anxiety depending on how that, how their cycle is going. So we see that rise and fall and we can kind of look at those levels and say, well, this is where it's happening. Is this where the hormones are dropping or where they're rising? And is there something we can do to address that and to modify the hormones? All right. Several questions. I figured right. I just have <laughs> yep. a drive-by. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, when we're talking about, you know, with Dutch test, we can look at cortisol over a four point measurement with either urine or, or saliva. Mm -hmm. I feel like you had said something about going in a provider checks cortisol. And so I actually had a client the other day who came with blood cortisol results. And so my question is this, I'm like, I don't really know how much weight to put on this because you were fasting. So you had other blood drawn, but like your cortisol is supposed to rise in the morning for cortisol waking your response. And it's supposed to go down. So like if you're getting a, just one sample whenever, because I learned it Dutch way with like four points, I don't feel like that's useful. Um, mm. Do you have, do you feel that it is useful? Is, is a singular blood test for cortisol useful at all or not really? It is useful. It's just useful in the big picture. I think if I had a wish list of the tests that people would take for to figure out what's going on with their system, it would be run a Dutch test. You get either, and you know, we have the five point salivary and we have the four point urine. Generally, they'll tell you the same things. The five point urine is a little bit more helpful because you get the cortisol awakening response, which is basically the rise and fall in the morning when you wake up is your baseline. And then you have a rise in over 30 to 60 minutes and, and then it comes down. And we look at these numbers and you can see how much hormone the patient is making at that time point. So you see the rise in the fall. With the urine, you don't necessarily see as much detail because you're collecting urine that's been in the bloodstream in the bladder. It's just a longer time frame between collection points. So if we're looking at these markers, we look at metabolized cortisol, which tells us how much cortisol the body is metabolizing. And it gives us cortisol and cortisone, kind of the ratio. And then it tells us, okay, your body is either metabolizing at a normal rate or it's slow or it's high. And it also tells you kind of what's in that peripheral system. Now, getting over to the blood that you'd ask about the single time point, a blood cortisol is going to tell you kind of, it's just going to give you the, how much cortisol and cortisone are in the bloodstream at the time, which includes bound and free. If you're looking at that number, it's a snapshot. It does fluctuate a little bit, but that pool, that bound pool, so cortisol and cortisone, let me just give you the very quick, what we think happens is that you get cortisol released from the gland. A good percentage of it gets converted to cortisone in the kidney and then after release from the gland, and then it can be reconverted back to cortisol from cortisone in the liver. So you have these active and inactive hormone that's floating around and being converted and reconverted over and over again based on the body's needs. If you are looking at the metabolized number, it's telling you what's in the free form that's being metabolized in the liver. If you're looking at blood, you're looking at kind of the total pool with free cortisol and cortisone in there. So the pool is bound to cortisol binding globulin and a smaller percent, a very small percent to albumin. So ideally, you would check blood cortisol, you would check cortisol binding globulin, maybe albumin, and then you would be looking at a Dutch test to get probably the best perspective for all time points. You can throw in a 24-hour urine, which isn't going to tell you much different than what you're seeing with Dutch. I think the test at Dutch is comprehensive enough to get a really decent understanding of what's going on. 
Well, I was just going to say, so if someone had like, literally, this is the case, someone gets, you know, some blood work done in Mm -hmm. one year and has cortisol checked and it's like 17. And then the next year also has same blood work, has cortisol checked. I presume in a similar timeframe, but how do you know for sure? Right. Because it's fasting. So you probably went and did it in the morning and then it's at like a two or a three or something. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't really know how useful this is. Because right. you're supposed to rise in the morning, you know, and right. then I'm not seeing all the other markers. So I can see where you're like, oh, it gives you a free pool. But really, what does that tell me next? Like, to me, it doesn't tell me much. Well, it's the end of the line. If that number is really low, you have to realize that your body's basically burned through the reserve, the amount that it's going to. And so if your metabolized cortisol and your free cortisol and cortisone are, are all low, you've got a burned out HPA. Well, the body's going to maintain some level of reserve. We have that reserve in the fat tissue. We have reserve in the cells. We have reserve in the cortisol binding globulin pool. That reserve will be a backup. And a lot of times patients with obesity have really, really high reserve in the, in the belly fat. They can use that supply, will leach into the bloodstream and, and can be a really strong backup. The problem is it creates a chronically high cortisol level, but that reserve in the bloodstream is pretty stable. It doesn't change a lot. The amount of free hormone in the bloodstream can change. And when we look at that, I think that the single time point just isn't that useful. I think we have to have some idea of how it rises and falls throughout the day and maybe how we want to address that. Because people's energy levels change throughout the day and we need to help them address that or whether the cortisol is high at night, we can run overnight samples Mm -hmm. as well. So, Mm -hmm. Okay, that's more helpful. Yeah, Yeah, that whole abdominal adiposity secreting cortisol drives me crazy because yeah. then it like makes it hard to read the testing where it's like, I think you're burned out, but no, you have plenty of cortisol being secreted from belly fat, which is like yeah. insane how the body works it, when, it it's is, trying to make ins- when it's trying to, you know, use essential hormones. But I think this comes back to the same thing. The body senses it's, it's in danger, mm-hmm. right? And whether or not, I mean, caloric intake definitely does matter. And I think that's one thing, but the body senses it's in danger. It's going to build a fat reserve so that it can be used for later if it's needed. I think when the secretion from the adrenal glands drops, I think that's when we can get in trouble and the body really wants to store what it has. And so how many of us have seen, had patients came in with that situation where it's really difficult for them to lose weight because the adrenal glands are not pushing out a lot of cortisol, but the visceral adipose reserve is is quite high. Mm -hmm. So it's a really difficult thing to deal with at that point. But I think there's a lot of metabolic dysregulation going on in that situation. Mm -hmm. If you have a couple of minutes before we end, I'd like to touch on how does cortisol or stress, I use these, they're not the same, right? I'm not, No. but sometimes we kind of refer to them similarly. So like how does stress in general impact sex hormones overall? I know you talked about it briefly about probably men having low T and and having more anxiety and giving them testosterone helps. Mm -hmm. What first causes low testosterone and how does stress impact estrogen and progesterone as well? Yeah. Let's just talk about stress and testosterone first, because I think it's Mm underappreciated. Lots of people talk about high cortisol and low testosterone. I think there's a scenario that works there, but I don't see it as often. I'll be honest with you. You know, when I'm looking at these cases and I see these, let's just take a male patient, for instance, because they produce a lot more testosterone. And those changes, if a patient is really stressed, can be dramatic. But in both males and females, when we see low adrenal output, we see low androgen output. When the body is in distress, the last thing it, it's going to do is, you know, make more androgens for you. And I think one of the things that I see consistently is low androgen output with low cortisol output. They're past the point of burnout. So cortisol rises, you get all of the stress, cortisol rises, eventually then it drops, it falls. We're in a later phase, adrenal stress and, or HPA stress, we should call it, but low testosterone resulting from stress is real. And I see that most often, not so much low testosterone with high cortisol. The chronic stress from the adrenal system, I would say more often than not, when the levels are low will affect all of the sex hormones. I do see that more than I do see high cortisol affecting the sex hormones. I think there's a scenario there that works. Oftentimes we'll see if patients, again, you're getting into situations where if a patient has low body weight, they may not be as effective as somebody who has higher body weight because of that visceral adiposity and that reserve that's constantly in the background running. I think you can't make blanket statements about high cortisol causes this hormone to be low in this one because we just don't see that. I think there are other factors that come into play. And again, I want to do this too. I want to oversimplify it and be able to say, oh, this is what it is. And you can't do that. So I would say in general, adrenal stress, 
low cortisol output is most closely associated with depleted hormones. Can we say this? Because you Mm -hmm. look at lots of tests in general, is there an epidemic of not having enough progesterone in overall? Because low progesterone is pretty, I always thought was pretty closely associated with anxiety because progesterone is calming. It is. And you can connect the neurotransmitter GABA, which is the major inhibitory neurotransmitter to progesterone. Progesterone, if you supplement orally, will lead to the production of allopregnenolone, which is sedating and and calming. And so, and we do get in general more GABA hits on GABA receptors when progesterone is adequate. Yeah, I think there is. I mean, progesterone seems to be the problem. It's kind of the counterbalance to estrogen. We don't have as many estrogen output problems as we do progesterone. And the reasons there are, we can go up to the hypothalamus and start talking about gonadotropins, which are compounds that help stimulate the release of estrogen and progesterone from the ovaries. And those are called LH and FSH. FSH stimulates the release of the estrogen and progesterone results from LH levels that are appropriate. The problem is that signaling the gonadotropin releasing hormone that signals the the LH and FSH to work is interrupted with stress. So we can see all kinds of problems, which is why there's cycle irregularity. There are a whole bunch more factors too, including, you know, environmental toxins and things, different mechanisms, the, the stress that we are exposed to under that. But ultimately, when the patient is stressed and not in a relaxed state, they're less likely to cycle appropriately. And progesterone is always the biggest part of that. And since we are on the topic of progesterone and people will be like, cool, I'll just take something from my progesterone. Mm-hmm. Not exactly that simple. What would you no. say to that person? I think they have to find out what's potentially what the problem is. You know, and I'll go back to what we do at Dutch. We do, we have this Dutch test that's done between 18 to 21 on the cycle day 18 to 21 in the cycle, or five to seven days after ovulation peak, when they do an ovulation predictor kit. If we're testing and trying to figure out what's going on, we actually have to have a more comprehensive picture. We can go with something like cycle mapping. Cycle mapping is a test that we offer that shows the progesterone and estrogen peak. And I think when it comes down to it, you can look at a single day and get some information. But knowing what that progesterone estrogen peak looks like can inform you where you want to go. The ovary, basically the body in females cycles from one ovary to the other, and it doesn't necessarily go back and forth each month. Sometimes the cycling and the hormone production will come from one ovary up to seven times, I think they've they've found. And so instead of alternating, we can't know which ovary is we're actually looking at unless somebody does an ultrasound. They can actually look at an ultrasound and find out which side they're ovulating from, and then they can get an understanding by testing. And we've actually had providers do that. So we can actually see which ovary is not working. So coming back to the point or the question that you were asking, progesterone, it can be low because of poor LH signaling, because of high androgens, other factors that are unknown, or ovarian response. The progesterone comes from the corpus luteum, which is released, the egg that's released. If the ovarian reserve in that patient is low, you're going to have early declining levels over time. Supplementation with progesterone in the luteal phase can be helpful in these patients. But if you have a patient who has a signaling problem, you're better off trying to figure out if it's a signaling problem or if it's actually there's a functional problem with the ovary. And I think the distinction between those two is not readily apparent. Mm-hmm. But we have to look at, at both situations and say, is this signaling or is this a mechanical problem with the ovary and the output of the corpus luteum? And if it's a mechanical problem, that goes, I mean, that's more of a doctor, we're going to do ultrasound. Like what are some of the potential issues that could be a mechanical problem with the ovary? Scar tissue that results from cysts that are formed and ruptured. Mm-hmm. And I think that would be the main, I mean, I'm not a gynecologist, but Dr. Jones, Carrie Jones is the medical director here at Dutch, and she does, says in her lectures, the ovaries are sisters, not twins. And the implication there is that the progesterone is going, the release of progesterone is going to be different from one side to the other. And sometimes we just have an ovary that just chronically underperforms and we can't know why. It's not a great answer, but I think we're just not there yet. I think we have to admit that there's a lot of stuff we don't know about this, but mechanical obstruction for releasing the egg can be a problem. And I think we have to understand that there's either a mechanical problem with the ovary or there's a signaling problem or there's both because there can certainly be both. And I think the hard part is teasing that out, but we do have some tools at Dutch to be able to, to further tease that out and see if we can't come up with something that makes sense. 
And just to acknowledge, if there's scar tissue from stiff cysts that are formed or ruptured, there's usually elevated estrogen and low progesterone in that scenario as well, right? Can you repeat that elevated yep. estrogen have, and low progesterone? Yeah. Yeah. That would be like the common scenario if you've got scar tissue with cysts formed and ruptured. Yeah. And I think that the term estrogen dominance has probably been overused a bit, but yeah, you can see higher estrogen and you can see lower progesterone then they're in an estrogen dominant state. And then I think that then we're looking at trying to correct that. And with the estrogen, how do we remove the estrogen from the body in the most efficient manner possible? But then ultimately, how do we get that balance back so that we can get a healthy cycling from both ovaries if possible? Yeah. And I would say Googling that particular topic is a bit dangerous. And I do have a <laughs> podcast about estrogen metabolism. I don't yeah. know if it's called Hormones 101 or Estrogen Metabolism, or I think I do. We'll try to find it and put it in the show notes. Nice. Oh, Dr. Hyatt. That was fun. We could have talked That's about so this for fun a lot, talking to you. lot longer. <laughs> we could talk yeah, about we've had lots of these through Dutch, but it's really nice to be able to connect with you on this level and yeah. talk about some bigger things. So cool. thank you. Where should people find you online or learn more if they want? And I can obviously be contacted through Dutch That's biogenic better. nutrition side. So yeah. But you're president of biogenic nutrition, which has some different products and your consultant at Dutch yeah. and that's how we can find you. So yeah. thank you so yeah. much for coming on today. Thank you, Chris. I really appreciate it and enjoyed talking with you today. Sharing and reviewing this podcast is the best way to help us succeed with our mission to help integrate the best of East and West and empower you to raise the bar on your health story. Just go to review this podcast.com forward slash less stressed life. That's review this podcast.com forward slash less stressed life. And you'll be taken directly to a page where you can insert your review and hit post.